we'll go back to. All right, so we don't know a lot, but here's what we do know. So let me summarize this future battle. We know that a leader from the North, in the story, he's called Gog. We know that he is going to lead a country, a nation, the Bible calls Magog. We do not know where that is or who that is, okay? Just not clear. He'll be motivated by his own evil plans, okay? But once he's made those plans, he's going to be pulled in by God like a hook, right? It'll be, the plan will become irresistible to him. But I just want to emphasize God did not make Gog do this. God did not make, make Magog do this. This was their own idea, their own plan. It happens in the latter days. It's distant from Ezekiel's time. It's still in the future for us. It's kind of pointless to try to speculate the when. I'll get to the when in a minute. Um, <laughs> the allied nations are going to come from every point on the compass, Persia, Iran, modern day, Turkey, Libya, Ethiopia, perhaps even Armenia, some of the scholars were writing. So literally from all four points of the compass, this armada, this, I keep saying armada, it's not a navy, this army of seven nations comes against them led by Magog. It'll be a massive, swift, well-equipped army, uh, probably the biggest one that's ever been assembled against God's people, Israel. It will happen when they've been gathered back to their land. Now, they were gathered back to their land 70 years after the exile during the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. So it could have been then, uh, all the way through the Roman conquest of AD 70, because so it could have been in those 400 years or so, or it could have been since 1948. Here's why it isn't either of those. Gog will come against Israel when they enjoy considerable safety. And as I've already outlined, the time between Ezra and the Roman occupation and destruction in AD 70, there was no time of relative safety for the Jews. Since 1948 to present, there's been no time of relative safety for the Jews. So this is referring to a time still distant in the future. They're going to come against Israel when it's prosperous, when they're producing, when they're highly productive. Other nations will watch and wonder how they may take advantage of the situation. Okay, They don't have enough guts to do it themselves. But you have vulture nations that it mentioned who would, oh, how can we profit from this? Yahweh will defeat uh, the enemy. He will defend his people Israel and therefore thereby glorify himself in the process in front of all the rest of the nations of the world. And this prophecy would fulfill several other previous prophecies concerning Israel. So you might ask the when question. Since it's in the future, you can theorize. When could this be? So there's um, four, I think there's four main theories here. Here's the answer. We don't know. Okay, so here's the four main theories. The battle may happen before the beginning of the last seven-year period in human history called the tribulation, before the glorious return of Jesus Christ. So it happens pre-trib, okay? Uh, and in some way, it may actually usher in the final world leader, the one world leader who will be the Antichrist. It may be a pivotal event to him taking the, the, the scene by storm, okay? That's one theory, we don't know. Another theory is it happens in the middle of the seven year tribulation, three and a half years into the tribulation when the Antichrist declares to the Jews, I'm your God, I'm your Messiah. And they realize, uh-oh, uh, we've hitched our wagon to the wrong horse. Uh, this guy's a fraud and gr great persecution then begins on the Jews. So it could mark this 
hostility against Israel in the last three and a half years of the tribulation that other books of the Bible like Revelation talk about. Uh, the battle could happen at the end of the seven year period of tribulation um, before Jesus Christ returns. Um, there is a connection if you read Revelation, which we've already studied that book, but in Revelations 19, 17, and 18, it, and also in the next chapter of Ezekiel, it has some inferences where it could be at the end of the seven-year period, and that is the final straw that brings in Christ, and he returns to defend his nation, Israel. Um, and it may happen, as it speaks about in Revelation 20, um, and this is the thousand year millennial reign. Now, not all Christians agree that Christ will actually be physically present on the earth during this thousand year millennial reign. There's different views on this. This is metaphorical. It's not a literal physical presence of Christ on the earth for a thousand years reigning and ruling. Um, again, we're not gonna go there, but if it is a physical presence, there is a battle mentioned uh, towards the end of the thousand year period where Satan is released one last time and there's this great assembling of an army to come against Israel one last time and that's the last battle spoken of in human history and it's in Revelation 20 and after that battle Satan is thrown into finally Gehenna which has been which is what we call hell Hell is unoccupied. Satan is finally thrown into hell and all the demons that were with him are thrown into hell. And then the Lamb's book of life is, is open. There's the judgment seat that you appear before. And if your name is in the Lamb's book of life, you go to heaven. If it's not, you go to the other place, Gehenna. There's no more Hades at that point. So in any case, it could happen then. So there's four different theories. Each one of these has pros and has cons. Um, I think this is one of those cases which we've studied before where you won't know it until after you're either in it or looking back from it, that it will, it will be clear. So what on earth can you possibly garnish from this? As a New Testament believer, I really struggled with what on Lord, what are you trying to, to, to tell us as a new Testament believer, this is great history, future history. This is fascinating to know. Um, but what, you know, what am I supposed to learn from this? How am I supposed to profit from this knowledge of this battle where so many of the details are obscured and we don't understand all the different facets. So what am I supposed to learn from this? So that was a lot of prayer this week and a lot of asking God. You could take yourselves off mute now. So, hey, the beauty of this is as you listen to God's word, the Holy Spirit creates your own teaching in your own heart. And like I said before, many times I've gone through, I've given you my main message, and then somebody emails me or texts me later who either listened live or watched it later on YouTube, and they got something really profound out of it, but it wasn't even my main message. It was some other thing that we mentioned as we went through scripture, and that's the beauty of scripture, and that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit, is he teaches us different things based on his word and his Holy Spirit. But I, my job is to come up with what I think is the main message or the main thrust of the passage. And it's simply this. I'll elaborate, but it's simply this. Be on the right side of God. Um, he is merciful and he is full of grace. And I think we can all say amen to that. He is amen. merciful. He is full of grace. But when you are hell bound and hell bent determined to align yourself against God, 
the Bible just simply uses one word, which is going to convey how that turns out from you. And do you know what the word is? It's three letters, really simple. Whoa. Not W-H-O-A, like you'd say to horses, but W-O-E. Woe. Woe. Woe to those. Woe to him. Woe to they. Woe. And woe, the implication of woe is it's almost a lament that you would do at somebody's tragic funeral or when something tragic happens to somebody, um, it is the sense of overwhelming and unrelenting grief and, and of something terrible that's going to happen, something forbidding, foreboding, mm -hmm. ominous, overwhelming, awesome in a very bad way. So I tried to think of an illustration, then I'll give you two more woes. So I like sci-fi. Huge surprise there. Um, started watching a new series on Prime. It's War of the Worlds. I think it's a French and British production. There's some parts that are subtitled, but it's well done. War of the Worlds, very famous story. You know the story. H.G. Wells writes this book and it's 1898. 1898 about this invasion of this guy was so far ahead of his time as a as a visionary sci-fi writer hg wells he writes this story about us being invaded by another world by another by an alien species and it's uh people are destroyed by heat rays and they melt and it's and just it's awful it's terrible and the book was so captivating and so ahead of its time, it became a classic. And he was obviously propelled to the ranks of one of the greatest science fiction writers of history and human history. Well, in 1938, so 40 years later, there was a young man, 23 years old, 1938, 23 years old. He had already had a two or three year um, experience, history in radio, doing a broadcast called The Shadow. And he was the voice of The Shadow. Only The Shadow knows. <laughs> and he and his group called the Mercury Theater decided they were going to pull off a play. Now, there was no TV in 1938. You listen to basically one of pretty much two broadcasts, the National Broadcasting Corporation NBC that we call today and Columbia Broadcasting Systems or what we call CBS. And at that time, the big show that everybody watched, do you remember? Charlie McCarthy, um, great ventriloquist. What was the dummy's name? You guys remember? I'm trying to remember the dummy's name. L L L something. Elmer. Elmer. Um, was it? I'll try to I'll try to find it as I'm talking to you. It was on the History Channel. I read a a great article. Um, oh, Charlie McCarthy. Edgar Bergen was the name of the ventriloquist. Charlie McCarthy was the name of his mm -hmm. dummy. Right. And it was the most popular show on radio. But after he did his gig, um, 12 minutes into the show on NBC, they put on a little known uh, singer. You know, these were variety shows. And so guess what? Even back then people channel surf, just like you guys do. And they switched over to CBS who was already in a broadcast of a dramatization of a play from a book called War of the Worlds. Yeah. Mm. Now the young man's name that came up with this genius radio broadcast was Orson Welles of no, of no relation to H.G. Wells, 23 years old. And he had special effects, sound effects. He had a cast of characters uh, and they, they did this as if it were actually happening a live broadcast. However, it was still 
radio. And they did give a disclaimer at the beginning of the show that this was um, a dramatization. This was not real. Unfortunately, the millions of people who are tuning in from uh, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy when their act went off and this unknown singer came on, people got bored. They switched channels. Um, this is what they heard. Suddenly there was a, uh, um, they were introduced. This is the coming live from the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York. Well, you'll be entertained by the music of Ramon Raquello in his orchestra. And then a few minutes of future dance mu music played. Uh, and I'm sure people probably flipped back to NBC at that time. And then the scare began. In the middle of the future dance music, an announcer broke in to report, Professor Farrell at the Mount Jennings Observatory has detected explosions on the planet Mars. Then the dance music came back on. I mean, this thing was so well orchestrated. Then later in the middle of the dance music, another interruption came on in which listeners informed a large meteor had crashed into a farmer's field in Grover Mills, New, J New Jersey. Now people's hair was starting to stand up on the back of their neck, goosebumps on their arms. Pretty soon an announcer broke in at the crash site describing a Martian emerging from a large metallic cylinder. Remember, no TV, guys, your imagination. Good heavens, he declared. Something's wriggling out of the shadow. It's like a, it's like a gray snake. Oh, here's another, there's another and another. Uh, they look like, like tentacles to me. I, I can see the thing's body now. It, it, it's large, it's, it's large as a bear. It, it glistens like, like wet leather, but that face, Oh, it, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black, they're green. They, they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is, is V-shaped and saliva dripping from its rimless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. And then he went on to describe the machines fired heat rays at puny humans and melted them where they stood. And then the announcement went on further. They've annihilated a force of 7,000 National Guardsmen. They've been attacked by artilleries, bombers. They're releasing a poisonous gas. They go silent. Now, hmm. in 1938, this caused a national scare. CBS was actually investigated by what was then the FAA and they were actually found to have done nothing wrong because they did give a disclaimer at the beginning and the end of the broadcast. But for people who were Edgar Bergen fans, they missed that. And there was panic. It probably wasn't millions of people. The newspapers, interestingly enough, hated the radio people because they were competitors and they wanted to discredit radio as a source of news. So the newspapers the next day blew the thing out of the proportion and they said it was a national panic. Millions of people fled their homes in states of panic. There were car accidents, fires, pandemonium and panic broke out. The truth was probably somewhat less than that, but they wanted to discredit radio and they say such a thing would never happen if you listen to the newspapers as your source of news <laughs> instead of the radio. But Orson Welles pulled off one of the greatest hoaxes in broadcasting history, and he didn't mean to. He really didn't mean to. That was not his intent. Um, it was just simply, he meant to be a well-done drama. Um, by the way, three years later, at the age of 26, he would go on to a career in Hollywood because this launched his career and he, he directed a, a movie called Citizen Kane, which is still today considered one of the greatest movies in American history, Orson Welles. 1950s, they made the movie to a great science fiction movie in the 1950s. And then later on, Tom Cruise started a remake of it, War of the Worlds, and then now this series on Prime. So as you go through the series, Lynn, what does this have to do with what you're talking about with woe? 
you know how I insert myself into stories. That's why I liked writing fiction when I wrote fictional stories for you guys. Um, I get into the story and I block out everything and I'm in the story. And I'm telling you the fear that people felt in 1938 and the, 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 the concerns displayed on the screen and the movie theaters during the Tom Cruise movie on the 1950, it's palpable. It is a sense of foreboding and doom and destruction and inescapable pain and suffering that's coming at you. Mm. If that could capture the image for you, I'll use one simple word, woe, oh. W-O-E. See, God loves the sinner, and he even loves the perpetrator. But if you insist, if you insist on being his enemy, whoa. Mm. God's going to protect his people, Israel. God's going to protect his church, the bride of Christ. As a child of God, you can expect people to come against you. As the nation Israel as a Jew, you can expect people to come against you, but to them that oppose the nation of Israel and to them who oppose the church, the bride of Christ, one word. Whoa. Whoa. That sense of foreboding that you get the sense of in the war of the worlds, like we're doomed. They just nuked 7,000 National Guardsmen that in 1950s, they dropped nukes on it and no effect. We used everything we had against them in the Tom Cruise movie, no effect. So you think, whoa. And that's the sense of woe that's going to happen to those who oppose the church of Jesus Christ. So what's the takeaway from me? Be on the right side of God. Be on the side that he's fighting for, not fighting against. Don't become so arrogant in your human, puny human pride that you think that you can oppose God and it will not have consequences. Now, again, he's merciful. And he's merciful to the sinner and he's merciful to the perpetrator. He would have been merciful to Gog and Magog had they changed their ways, fell on their knees and honored him. But they didn't. They insisted on their path. And to them, God says, whoa. whoa. All right. That's what I got out of it. Open it up for questions. Ezekiel 38. Again, 39 will be along similar lines. We're going to talk more about Gog and Magog and the battle. But let me see if you guys have any questions about chapter 38 or about War of the Worlds. Just kidding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just want to say, um, uh, it, prophetically, it's widely held that uh, Rosh is Russia, Tubal is uh, Turkey, and Iran's in there. So that's commonly held prophetic belief. Eh? So you've got my mind all screwed up coming from this different avenue. Oh, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the only connection to Russia is the word Prince of Rosh, and that's where those uh, scholars got that from. And linguistically, you can't take a Hebrew word and relate it to an English word that vaguely sounds similar, but it's not even, you would never confuse the word Rosh with Russia. But anyway, Two blitz, uh, there's a Russian city that they say is the two ball. Moscow is the a Meshek word, but there's no root words in the Russian language that identify with the Hebrew. So it's kind of a stretch. Could be. It doesn't rule it out, Steve. Could be. It is a nice, tidy little put a bow on it um, theory. But to me, we don't know. It doesn't matter. Those characters, this could be a thousand years from now. And who, like I said earlier, it could be those crazy Norwegians. Just kidding. I love Norwegians. <laughs> it could be those Norwegians 
that this is talking about. Who knows? Finland, a country that's not even named yet. That's a combination mm -hmm. of countries. Um, you know, it's it's the Dutch. We can always blame it on the Dutch. <laughs> oh, Trump. Uh, that's an Austin yes. Powers line, guys. We don't we don't care what you are. Like I said, I'm I'm a big mixed bag. Yes, Bill. Will Will the, Will. Uh, one thing is that we know of uh, is that since the Persian Gulf War, is how easy it is to get a huge army within a matter of hours there. I mean, like we did in the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War. I mean, and there was many, many, many nations, not just one, it's a coalition of nations. So this can happen within, again, uh, weeks, a couple of weeks, that's right, a couple of weeks. Uh, so we're in that era that it's a possibility. Uh, doesn't mean it's going to happen in our lifetimes, but again, it's possible now. The other yep. thing well, is Will, just wait. In a thousand years, you'll be able to get them there in minutes because you'll just transport them there. Like in Star Trek, Trek. We'll beam them over. Okay, go no, ahead. No, no, no. I agree. Yeah. I like science fiction too. Uh, the other thing is that uh, concerning the, the war, Og and Magog war, uh, it's, uh, it's, for example, we have several types of antichrist. Okay, we had, for example, uh, Epiphanes was one, uh, Nero was one, and our most recent was Hitler. Hitler was obviously one. Uh, so, uh, I mean, he had his uh, Third Reich, again, a false millennium of his own. Uh, he had his uh, minister of uh, propaganda, Gobble. I mean, uh, so he's a, uh, a taste, a shadow, uh, which I know you heard, of things to come. And uh, so, again, yeah. I believe that Og and Magog, that's my opinion, uh, is not just once. I think it is prior to, and then again, we're going to have it again at the end of the millennium. That's the way I feel, my personal feeling. It represents more than okay. one stage. It is one of the theories. Yep, it's one of the theories because for sure. Again, uh, the way God writes things, he goes like forward, backwards, forward, backwards, forward, backwards, in and out. Uh, but I, I love your woe. Uh, I think that uh, we never had had a woe. Uh, even when we say, well, a hurricane is coming still, or the fires in California. We haven't had a woe, not in this country. We haven't had a woe that we can feel it. Uh, like, let's say, when you had uh, huge armies and uh, Napoleon, and when other people say, hey, we're doomed, I mean, nothing we can do about it. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and yes, and I had to say this, uh, I mentioned to them, Rosebud, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Any other questions, I got comments? a little more to say on the Russia and Turkey. They are in the Middle East now in, uh, oh, come on, trying to think of, they're, they're in a nation, Turkey, they're both in the same nation, and it's predicted that that nation will be reduced to rubble. But anyway, Rosh is already in the Middle East. They've come in through the Black Sea. They have access to the whole Middle East. And they're, they're fighting wars in Syria now so uh, they've already they're already there. So uh, and I don't think they're planning on leaving anytime soon. Just something to consider. Yep. A anybody else? Well, you guys got it all figured out. That's no, good. we don't. You you, yeah, you, no. you just Whoa. tilted our minds. You got us all mixed up. No. No. <laughs> this is Lee. I just want to put a personal note in here. <clears throat> when you mentioned the word woe, I reflected back during some of the years of my going to college when I was leaving my, my hometown and subjected to things that I wasn't really prepared for, temptation-wise. And I think I was in a woe spot. But I am thankful for a set of parents and a grandmother who I know faithfully prayed for me and lifted me up before the throne of grace. 
or I hate to think what could have happened to me when I was in my woe days. <laughs> so I appreciate yeah. you mentioning that because it's very real. And we have a lot of things happening now in our very country that are just frightening to think about what the spin-off can be yeah. from all of that. Okay. It's very good. Appreciate well, it. Well, my, my takeaway was just simply this. Um, you know, we, I, I'm using me, maybe I'm an exception, but I've, I've aligned myself against God before. Every time I do premeditated sin, in essence, I'm saying I'm rejecting you and your will for me, Lord, and I'm going to go off and do this. Even, and, and I know it's yeah. wrong. And when you do that, I need to look at woe, W-O-E, woe so i should woe w h o a right i should i should think through what that's going to mean if i align myself against god we spend an inordinate amount of time in breaking bread talking about god's mercy and his grace and his long suffering and his patience and his forgiveness and i think those are awesome attributes that we do need to focus on however we can't not focus on the other side of the coin, which is W-O-E. And that is if you align yourself against God and you insist upon making him your enemy, well, first of all, it's just absolute foolishness to even think that you're going to align yourself against God, but he will do what he did to, to uh, Gog and Magog. He'll give you over to your desires and he will let you go on your merry way with all the destruction and everything that's going to happen, the woe, W-O-E, that's going to happen. So we just need to all occasionally be reminded that, yes, God is merciful and he's gracious and he's patient. But when we're thinking about sinning against him intentionally and on a premeditated basis, we need to think about what that's going to do, W-O-E, and then that we should in what we should then do next is WHOA, which is just, whoa, don't go there. Don't go there. All, all, right. of, uh, all, of, God's, all of God's blessings that he uh, proclaimed to Israel, he came through with. And all of his curses that he placed on Israel, he came through with. So he, he whatever he said he was going to do, he did. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's why we ought to have a woe. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I don't think Israel's out of the woods yet as far as curses go. No, they probably still have a little bit to go through before they finally get it, but they will get it. The book says they get it in the end. Uh, they still got blessings. They that... still got blessings to look forward to also. Right. Yeah. yeah. But how many of them know that? Not many, you know, most of the Jews in Israel are secular right now, but um, that humanist. will change. Right, right, right. So hopefully it changes. Lee, I'm with, out. Lee, are you in Edgewater? Yes, I am. Okay, Will, you're in Edgewater? Will, you're on mute, buddy. I'm in Port Orange. I'd like to meet Lee if I can. Okay, so I'll, if it's okay with you guys, I'll will send you both each other's emails, and you can okay. you can go on an online dating service <laughs> and go from there. Work for you. Senior citizen discount. I just take a small I just take a small fee. All right, I got three minutes. I want to say my goodbyes. Goodbye, Ned. Goodbye, Lee. Goodbye, Will. Goodbye, Jim. Goodbye, Ron. Give me a wave, Linda. Yeah, there we go. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Goodbye, Bye. Steve. Dan, thank you for running session one. Paul, thank you for joining. Oh, that looks like a very smart Studious. looking office. Wow. That would rival Jim's for the intelligence quotient blue on the octopus. office. Ah. Yeah, the, the blue octopus kind of loses some credibility. <laughs> Jim doesn't have a blue octopus. All right, guys, remember to pray for Ken and please remember to lift up Priscilla. She needs a miracle. Um, and I will, uh, Paul, are you alone? Are you able to pray for us to close?
I actually have a patient who's waiting to come back. Okay, so I won't no be thank problem. You. Ned, would you mind closing us in prayer today? I'm all sure it's well. Thank you. Father, we came before you today expecting to learn, Father. And we have learned today, Father. We want to thank you. Thank Lynn. Thank you through Lynn that you have taught us, Father. And open our eyes to some things that we probably hadn't thought of and hadn't seen before, Father. We want you to bless us today, Father. Go with Ken. Go with Dana, go with Steve's brother-in-law, Steve's sister-in-law, Father, Priscilla, and Bill, I believe Bill was in there too, Father. So we want you to bless all of those. Bless us, Father. Thank you for the teachings, Father. And as we depart from you today in this session, Father, let us never depart from you in real life, Father. These and other things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank yeah. you, guys. Amen. I will see you. See you next week, and we'll go for some more Gog and Magog. Yeah. Okay. Gog and Magog. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lim. See you. Thank you guys for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you for the prayers. All right. Thank you guys. Thank